Good morning. It is October 11th. It is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. And for those of us who live in Canada, it is our national Thanksgiving weekend. And on this day, we give thanks to God for life, for love, for friendship, for food, and I give thanks to God for you. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Generous and forgiving God, you are the first and the last, the giver of all good things. Your glory is endless, your power incomparable. Your love stretches wider than the universe. Your mercy reaches beyond the heights of heaven. We gather with hearts thankful for the abundance of your creation to worship you and adore you. Inspired by this time of worship, may our hearts overflow with praise each and every day. And may our lives reflect our gratitude to you in the ways we share your abundant love in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, let us confess our sins before God and one another as together we say, Generous and loving God, we confess that in a world where many do not have enough, we enjoy more than we need. In a world where many live in fear, we take peace for granted. In a world where many have lost hope, we become indifferent to despair and grumble about small things. Forgive us, merciful God, and transform our lives to shine with the generosity, peace, and hope you offer us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now, the collect for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Almighty God, in our baptism, you adopted us for your own. Quicken, we pray, your spirit within us, that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be re rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. 
Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It may be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we say together, seek the Lord by the full verse. Seek the Lord while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near. That the wicked wicked forsake forsake their their ways ways, and the the evil evil ones their thoughts. And let them turn to the Lord and he will have compassion and to our God for he will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as rain and snow fall from the heavens, and and return return not again, again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating. So is is my my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I have sent it. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. And again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, maltreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It is, uh, I think, a wonderful bit of synchronicity that on this Thanksgiving weekend, we have two scripture readings that are about banquets, um, though they're not necessarily feel-good stories. Uh, The reading from Isaiah. The reading from Isaiah is one which has very, very many warm associations for so many people. Um, The second half of it does, at least, where we hear words about he will swallow up death forever and that God will wipe away the tears from all the faces. it's, It's a reading that gets read at so many funerals. In fact, I plan on having it read at my funeral, though God willing, not for a while. but it, it, it gives us visions of that, that world where there's no, no pain or, or sorrow, but, but life eternal. And, and that's glorious and it's wonderful. It just actually isn't anything to do with what Isaiah was talking about. Um, Isaiah was not talking about a view of the resurrection. That didn't come along for probably five centuries after he wrote um, 
we would do well today. I think it's important for our world today that we understand what, in fact, Isaiah was talking about because he speaks powerfully to us. Listen, we, we go back to the end of chapter 24 and, and listen to what Isaiah is saying. He said, the earth is utterly broken. Listen to this. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is torn asunder. The earth is violently shaken. The earth staggers like a drunkard. It sways like a hut. Its transgressions lie heavily upon it and it falls and will not rise again. Isaiah shares there his vision of God's broken world, a world which is desperately, desperately in need of healing. And then he goes on to say, for the Lord of hosts will reign on the Mount of Zion in Jerusalem. And before his elders, he will manifest his glory. And from that point, he kicks in to chapter 25. And listen to these words. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. What Isaiah is talking about here is God's plan for humanity, God's plan for healing a broken humanity, God's plan that the people of Israel would become such a beacon of hope and justice and love and peace that the whole world would be healed, that that the world that was created to be beautiful and good in creation would be restored and that God would reign on Mount Zion. And then he goes on to talk about the city and he talks about the city in terms that are not glorious. He refers to the city three times as ruthless, ruthless, ruthless. Now, some people suggest that the city that he's talking about here is Babylon, possibly, but unlikely. I think the city that he's talking about is more than a city. I think the city is a metaphor for every place, every place where there is pain and oppression and exploitation, poverty and human suffering brought about by ruthless people who are more concerned about their well-being, more concerned about their way of life than they are about the humanity, and the well-being of their neighbors. The ruthless, the ruthless, the ruthless. Talks about that three times. And then he moves into the second part of the reading. On this mountain. Okay, he's talking about Mount Zion. On Mount Zion, the Lord will make for all peoples. Listen to that word. The Lord will make for all peoples for all nations, for all people. He will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow of well-aged wine, strained clear. He is talking about a magnificent banquet, a magnificent feast that is going to be held not at the expense of the poor, not in exclusion, of the poor. But pictures portrays the kingdom of God as a feast in which all are invited. All will partake. He is talking about a reversal of the societal order which dehumanizes and destroys human life. And it's a glorious moment. And he goes on to say, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples. Now, shroud, obviously the cloth that, that covers the dead, but in this case, the shroud which covers all people is humiliation and shame and suffering and fear and loss and, and, and hopelessness. On that mountain, in the kingdom of God, when all are invited to the feast, 
all of those emotions which create a pall which destroys human life, which deadens the spirit, they're going to be removed. They're going to be taken away forever. And God will wipe away every tear. There will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more loss, no more mourning. There will be joy and thanksgiving and excitement and peace and justice and love the way God's creation was intended to be. And the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all of the earth. None, none will need to feel disgrace because of who they are, what they have, what they look like, what others have said about them. The world is going to be changed. Now, you have to understand that those who were well off, those who prospered from life in the city, those who got along pretty well in the ruthless cities, they did not care for this message from Isaiah, but it wasn't their message it was a poem, it was a song that was a song for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the broken, for the very ones for whom God was a refuge. It's an incredible passage of scripture, an incredible picture of the kingdom of God, an incredible picture of the reversal that will remove all that is destructive from the lives of humanity. Okay. Okay, we, we, we go on to Matthew's reading. And in Matthew's reading, we got, we got another banquet. We got another banquet going on here. But, but again, th this passage does not stand on its own. You're, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, we had the reading, which was a parable about the father who had two sons uh, who he tried to send out to work in the vineyard. You remember one said, I'm not going, but he went. The other said, I'm going, but he didn't. And, and the message of that, the message of that was a statement to the elites of the city, a statement to the religious leaders and, and the elders, a statement to those who were in charge that, that if you're going to make your way into the kingdom of God, you, you've got to take a look at the world from the end of the line, not from the place of privilege at the front of the line. You've got to be in a place where you can see human suffering for what it is and do something to change it. You have been called to jump into the waters of the Jordan and be baptized and renew your life and to make a change. And you said, no, you said no. And, and then last week, there was a reading from Matthew's gospel about an, another parable, and it was a parable uh, ab about a vineyard owner who, who put some servants in charge of the vineyard, and, and they were corrupt. And, and it's a retelling of Isaiah chapter 5, which by Jesus' day was widely understood to be a denunciation of the chief priests and, and the leaders of the city. Okay, so two parables in a row Jesus is sticking it to the leaders. He is sticking it to the chief priests, to the elders, to the wealthy because of the corruption, because of the exploitation that exists in the holiest place on earth. And he's very clear that they are responsible. Okay, so today we have Another parable, and this one's an invitation to the banquet and the banquet. And Jesus makes it pretty clear, just in case they forgot their metaphors, the banquet is an image for the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, listen, the kingdom of God is like this. And, and he tells a parable about folks who are invited to the banquet, but, but they choose not to come. And, and the master who's having the banquet says to his servants, Send them out. Tell them the time for the banquet is now. And they wouldn't go. And not only would they not go, they killed the servants who came to tell them about the banquet. 
So the master says, I've got all these tables that are empty. I've got a feast that needs to be consumed. So you go out to the highways, the byways, drag people in. And so the servants that were left alive went out and brought into the banquet, the poor, the marginalized, the broken, the sick, the lame, the halt, all of the people that the elite, the wealthy, the political and religious leaders in Jerusalem would have excluded from humanity they were the ones who were brought in to fill the banquet. Again, it's a portrayal of the reversal, the reversal when the kingdom of God comes. Now, there is a, a disturbing moment in, in this when the master comes in and sees that there is a fellow sitting at the banquet table. I mean, he came, he answered the call, but he's there in like a jogging suit and, and, and not his wedding wear. And, and the master gets ticked off and, and tosses him out into outer darkness. Well, Alice McKenzie, who I, I think she's absolutely right about this, says, this is not an episode of what not to wear. The issue is not one about somebody sitting at a table wearing a jogging suit instead of wedding clothes, but rather one who came to the banquet and the banquet being the image for the kingdom of God, but was not prepared to do the things required to live into the kingdom of God. He was not prepared to live justice, was not prepared to care for those who needed caring, was not prepared to live love, was not prepared to live into the kingdom. And so th there are no free meals. If you want to be part of the banquet, if you want to be part of this incredible kingdom feast, th then you have to be part of the kingdom movement. Uh, the purpose of this story, the purpose of this parable is to once again talk about the fact that the pain in the world is caused by corruption. The pain in the world comes from the ruthless city. The pain in the world comes from those who do not have issue with exploitation, do not have issue with making their way on the backs of others, who are so caught up with their own personal acquisitiveness that they have turned the city into a gated community. And that is the world which the kingdom of God is set to overthrow. How did that story play in Jesus' day? Not so well, they killed him. So the question is, how, how about our day? How does this story work in our world? What does it have to say to our city? What does it have to say to you? What does it have to say to me? I think, I think in, in the world in, in which we are living, we have to ask ourselves, when we look around, can we see, can we see any vestiges of Isaiah's ruthless city? Can we see any vestiges of people living with shame, with humiliation, with people who are ostracized, marginalized, dehumanized because of the color of their skin, because of their religion, because of their bank account? because of the way they behave? Do we see vestiges in our city of people who were pushed aside by those who somehow, by virtue of our own acquisitiveness, have turned our cities, our towns, and our villages into gated communities? where we will feel safe as long as they are out there. Do we, do we, when we hear phrases like 
white privilege. When we hear the cries from those who are involved with Black Lives Matter, do we respond with shame, with pain, or with anger and hostility? Are we prepared to see in, in our city the ruthless elements which cause us to judge? Are we prepared to see in the city, in the ruthless city, Muslim women who are jeered at and mocked for wearing veils? Are we able to see men and women and children from Muslim countries who are profiled because of their religion, ostracized because of their religion? Are we able to hear echoes of the words of Pharaoh from so long ago as he looked at the slaves? Are we able to hear the words of Pharaoh as people in our world today look at the poor and say they're lazy, they're lazy, they're lazy, and that's why they're poor? Are we able to hear that? L listen, listen, folks. We need to listen so terribly closely to the words of the prophet Isaiah. The earth is utterly broken. The earth is torn asunder. The earth is violently shaken. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, over all people, over all nations. Folks, listen, on this Thanksgiving weekend, we need to understand. We need to understand that we are being issued an invitation to a banquet. We have been issued an invitation to the kingdom of God. But to, to accept that invitation, you and I have got to be prepared to live our way into the kingdom, to put aside from our lives all that would be hurtful or harmful to anyone else, to look for opportunities to live and to love and to share and to heal. If we want to go to have a seat at the banquet, then we need to be prepared to do our part to remove the shroud to remove the shroud of pain and sorrow and loss and mourning and humiliation, which lies over all nations. And we must do our part to lovingly, tenderly, gently wipe away every tear from every eye. God expects no less from us. Our world needs no less from us. Our world is a fractured and broken place that needs to be healed. And, and, and if not us, then who? If not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Amen.
our faith, as together we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for all things that make life good and pray that all people will share in the blessings we know. For the world, for the wonders of earth, sea, and sky, for beauty in nature and wildlife, for the rhythm of the days and seasons. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For waters that refresh and sustain life, for soil that is fertile and rich, for those who tend crops and care for harvests, for those who produce, deliver, and market our food, and especially for those working tirelessly during the pandemic. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For days to work and strength to do it, for the many different gifts and talents you have given us, for challenges met, especially during months of pandemic relief, and for moments of leisure and rest when you restore us. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For human life, for talking and thinking together, working on problems and plans, for burdens and joy shared, for relationships that give life meaning, whether enjoyed face to face or at a distance. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For our circle of family and friends, for children and their curiosity and joy, for the insight that comes with patience and experience, and for events shared and memories cherished. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For your care and grace in times of anxiety, doubt, and grief for healing in times of illness, confusion, and distress, for rejuvenating strength and vision in times of renewal, for scientific knowledge and discovery to confront disease and improve health. We give you thanks, O God, and pray that all people share such blessings. For the trust we have that you hear each prayer and know every need, that you love and care for each soul and body, and that you walk with us through all our days and seasons, we give you thanks this day. Amen. Let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Go now, rejoicing always in the Lord. Stand firm in Jesus Christ and be of one mind in him. Always act with justice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. May God give you peace that passes all understanding. May Christ guard your hearts and minds. May the Holy Spirit plant within you all that is honorable and just and pure. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love and pray for, today 
tomorrow and forever. Amen.